All right, we are live. Thanks for tuning into the Sheet Metal Shaping Podcast, where we discuss the pursuit of sheet metal shaping education through traditional coach building techniques. My guest today on the show, all the way from Hastings, Nebraska, the home of Kool-Aid, Mr. Pat Brubaker. What's up, man? Oh, not not much. Just another fun-filled day. Another fun-filled day. What's going on in the shop today? Uh, some tool production, a uh, whole bunch of bench welding, a uh, bunch of surface finish work on tools, and a uh, little bit of sheet metal sprinkled in at the end of the week. Very nice. Very nice. Well, for the show today, we're going to talk uh, about just that. We're going to talk tools. We're going to talk classes. We're also going to talk scratch builds. You have a lot for uh, for anybody who hasn't seen your Instagram. Um, definitely go check it out. I'll link it up in the show notes. But you have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the shop. Scratch builds, hot rods. Uh, it looked like there was a, one of the photos that I saw. looked like a Maserati, like some kind of 50s European styling with that beautiful Coke bottle shape. And you got lots going on. Uh, that's a Aston Martin DBR one. And that, that is oh, wow. simply a, uh, it's a class project because the, the thirties era hot rods, unfortunately the class guys get them done too fast. And, uh, <laughs> most of my class guys come by airplane and rental car. There, there's six bodies in here that nobody could take home. I did. I didn't think that would be a problem I would have. So what do you do with the bodies? So the guys come in, they smash these things out and they look good when they're done. What do you, what do you do with the bodies? You put them on the road? How does that work? I, I really don't know yet. They're, they're all on top of my mezzanine and several of them are blown apart and thrown behind the ones that are put together. And it, it's just not a problem I anticipated. So the Aston Martin DBR one was just simply something that would take them longer to finish. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about that car. That's uh, when I saw it in that photo on your Instagram. Um, when I saw it, it was just it was just this beautiful skin. You could start to see like the flow coming over the front fenders and into that reverse on the doors and then up over the rear hump. Tell me about how that got started. I, I have kind of a eclectic taste in cars. I like what I like because I didn't I didn't grow up with any of them. And uh, coming from a racing background, I, I'm just fascinated with the sports car war era. Those mm -hmm. guys were absolutely crazy to drive those cars that fast with their heads sticking out. <laughs> um, so the, the Aston Martin DBR1 just kind of, that reached out and kind of grabbed at me. And I, I like making reverse curves, and I know a lot of people despise them. And uh, I just, I thought it would be a, a, good, a good subject for a class. We did... Uh, our concept development where we scaled that car from a technical drawing. And then you, you have to do some baseline algebra to always find the missing dimension. And that, right. that, that was fun to, to scale that up and, and kind of show the class guys how I go about that. Let's talk about that process. So how did you go about it? Well, I, I got started doing that process from pictures when we were racing. Um, because you, you you couldn't look at anybody else's car, you'd get uh, something thrown at you, but you could wander over to the track photographer and buy a picture of somebody else's car at attitude in the corner, and then <laughs> you'd start measuring the picture from the size of the wheel and the wheelbase and figure out the angles on their suspension parts. That that was that was a good ten dollar investment. Wow, that's pretty trick, eh? Going right, not even just talking about the skin, but talking about the, the geometry of the suspension. Yeah, yeah, that uh, open wheel racing is is a pretty brutal world. And yeah, the track photographer would have 15 pictures of somebody else's car and they'd always look at me funny why I'd buy those. But yeah, um, I always have to laugh when we, you see we a made car, a lot of things. One flip upside down or something. They they take pictures of the the bottom side, right? They want to know what the belly pan looks like because that's all your oh, aerodynamic yeah. package. Oh yeah. yeah, that translates well into into what I do now, um, making parts and pieces for people. I've, I've had to make a lot of stuff from pictures, and uh -huh. um, it, it's an irritation because you do a lot of math and a lot of scale work to find out that you're eighty percent wrong. <laughs> and uh but that that car was historic enough that i i knew what the tire and wheel size was and the wheelbase and uh i i believe i found a cowl height somewhere and mm. um you you start plugging all these dimensions in and it's it's kind of a dot matrix and they they make sense or they don't uh for sure do you always start with a side profile and i think or they only made five of them 
So I, I start with a side profile. Uh, that seems to be the easiest because once that side profile is kind of your, your center silhouette of your buck, because right. ev everything you can see from the side is the highest point of the crown in the middle of the car. And the, the technical drawing I found of the DBR one had the hood line in there. Mm -hmm. So on a, a side profile, that is the highest part of the crown in the center. And then a, a technical drawing of the front, you know how far back that goes because it's gain, it's an accelerating curve and it, it only fits where it fits. It can't go forward. It can't go back. It's, Right. So then you end up with something in, in quadrant, you know, it, it's, it's a lot easier when you get to the quadrant stage, but you, you have to, you have to do your due diligence and do the math to get there. For sure. If you're looking at something from the side and from the front and from the rear, does that give you everything that you need? Or do you, would you really prefer to have something top down as well to give you the shape of the side of the car too? Yes. We, we had a, a top down on the DBR one also. Mm, and, nice. uh, when you have your, your front and your rear quadrant on, your top down is the widest part of the car you can see from the top. So then your, your front and rear quadrants tell you how high or low that, that view is. So many, so many hours, I eh, had to get this right. Yeah, that, that uh, to, to prep and, and get all the full scale drawings done and all the math figured for that class took me, oh, it, it, it probably took 250 hours to just to prepare the class so they could use the drawings. Right. And then did you form the buck from after the, those 250 hours or was that within? No, that, that the buck was after that, that was all the scaling time and going, making full scale drawings. Yeah. How do you do it? I've seen people do it in full scale on, on butcher paper or on Tyvek or on steel sheet with magnets. I've seen people do a welding rod. Like how do you, once you get your, once you get your, we'll call it pencil sketch. Like where, where do you take it from there? The simple thing, I, I just, I put the technical drawing in Fusion 360. And oh. since you know what size the wheel is, you, you trace a wheel and then you measure the wheelbase and then it scales the drawing. And I could print that out with a grid on it of a, of a known size. And then my full scale drawings were... I, I think they were 12, the full scale drawing was 12 times bigger. So then a, a perspective gauge, I made a perspective gauge. It's just a cross. So if it's one inch here, it's 12 inches here. And uh. you, you label it A, B, C, D, one, two, three. And then you, you touch with your perspective gauge and then transfer that over there. But the irritating thing there is the width of the line matters because it's 12 <laughs> times different. Yeah, a pen, a, like a, a pen or a pencil at, I don't know, 20 thou times 12 works at the, I don't know, whatever it is, quarter inch or something. <laughs> it's a big difference. Yeah, you, you send back and you look at it and go, yep, that's goofy. I screwed up somewhere. At what point do you have to say, okay, artist interpretation, this is what I think it should be because I just don't have enough data. Well, Does that ever happen? On, on something like this, yes, because I, I, I believe believe they only made five of those cars and nobody's letting me touch one. <laughs> so we, we took a couple liberties with it uh, just just for entertainment value because anybody wants to harp about it. We'll say, well, as a good friend, a friend of mine, Dan Pate says, well, how'd you do yours? And really, what are you going to compare to? Go find one of the five and say, hey, oh, you're off by the quarter inch line. Like, come on. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and it, it was a race car. So if they had a better idea on Tuesday, that's what they did. All five of them are different than each other because they were yeah. always working on it. Yeah. What about the buck underneath? Uh, I forget if it was a wood buck or a metal, like a wire form. What do you prefer to use and why? Uh, that buck is a wire form and I, I do not prefer them. I, I prefer a solid surface because I'm a sweeps and templates kind of guy. I don't need to see the backside because sweeps and templates are dummy gauges they fit or they don't so let's talk about using those because they're it's such a divide right some people prefer the wire form um, i want to be able to see behind some people are full surface wood box some people are you know plywood uh let's let's break this down why do you prefer to use what you prefer to use the the wire form is, is quick there there's no question about it and uh it, as far as cost goes it, it's almost nothing but the the problem is you have to keep it in plane. 
you know, you think if you have a full scale drawing of a, a side of, of a car and you bend up that wire, it, it's not self-supporting. You have you have to figure out how to keep it from twisting and being in out of plane. If you just cut it out of wood, it's it's not going to move. Um, my my preferred method is a solid surface. It's it's a a simplified wood buck underneath and then filled with house spray foam. So then, <laughs> if your stations are ten inches apart, all you have to do is ferret ten inches to the next one. For the simple fact of on a solid surface buck or an egg crate buck, it's very easy to build in a hammer point. You're, you've got a quarter panel fit and uh, you've annealed an edge. You can just kind of get it started on the buck and then go to whatever your, your preferred turning tool is. And you know you're exactly where you should be. On, on a wire form, it's just hard to build in a hammer point. Do you ever worry about movement, humidity, anything like that? If, you know, if the roof leaks, uh, with a wood buck or even with a solid surface buck, or that's not really an issue that you've come across? Any Anything that I've made panels for, the variance from car to car is so much more than I would ever dream the wood would grow. <laughs> being, being around some coach-built cars, it, it's amazing. You, you measure the door handle from the bottom of the door to the center of the door handle, and it's three quarters of an inch different. <laughs> to me, I, I don't think the wood would ever grow or move that, that much. Well, we should hope not. Yeah. <laughs> no, you've got bigger problems if it did. Yeah, really. Eh? And then when you're working with these wood box, you talked earlier about making templates, um, and making gauges and so forth. How does that work for the folks at home who maybe haven't tried a wood box? The hard thing about a wood buck is, you know, a lot of people know what a finger gauge is you know you, you push it on something and it, it captures a curve well if, if you're anything like i am you walk around the back of the car and you bump it on something you have to go redo it again um sweeps and and just hard edge templates they they are a go no go gauge they you set it across the buck stations and it, it fares the points. So if you have a start, a middle and an end, you, you know where you're going. Uh, it's just, it's always been a lot simpler for me because it, it just fits or it doesn't. And then when you're making those, what do you make and them out tell, of? Tell, uh, we, we CNC cut all our own sweeps here in house. Um, the, the first set I made, uh, I made with a, a router and some kind of jig. And they worked well. I have no idea what scale they were on. They're they're simply a comparator. Um, right. But we we see and see cut them now on our on our plasma table to uh, the what the traditional railroad scale was. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what materials are you conventionally using? Because you can get these in plastic, aluminum. Uh, you can get like balsa. What like they they come all over, right? Oh yeah, yeah. The the ones that we we make and sell are. Uh, just hot rolled pickled and oiled and we don't paint them or powder coat them and i catch a little flack for that and i always tell people if they were painted or powder coated you wouldn't dare clamp them together to build you out a, a spine uh, and i said that's why they're not painted you write on them clamp them together they are a tool and they right. they need to be used as such i have a lot a lot of guys that want uh plastic ones for measuring uh, painted surfaces and we, we have tooled up to do that. It's just I, I haven't had time to do a run of them yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer the longer sweeps, the shorter sweeps? Like when you're making these things, I mean, I guess the, the possibilities are really endless. Is there a, we'll call it like, is there a preferred set that you like to use in the shop in terms of length and, and sweep gauge and the rest of it? Uh, depends on what you're working on. What, what I have are 10 inch, 20 inch and 40 inch. Um, your 40 inch sweeps are almost, almost worthless on a thirties era hot rod because <laughs> the, the car isn't that big, but you, you get into, uh, you know, more of a luxury type collector's car. And, you know, the, the swoop from the fender back to the cowl might be five feet long on that. And your, your 40 inch sweep there is very helpful. It just, just depends on the size of the part really. Yeah. It's amazing how air has changed a twenties and thirties car versus a forties and fifties car. 
a 60s car versus a modern pickup truck, like so different in terms of styling and so different in terms of tools. That's kind of the goofy thing. Uh, a lot of people walk into my shop and they just, I, I, funny thing, I had a guy from England over here and he said, uh, oh, I see you gave the chaps the day off. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you do have a man to run each piece of equipment, correct? And I said, no. I said, it's just, that, that's that's my tools. And he, he couldn't believe that. So he was saying that people would specialize in one object, yeah. one tool, one item, whereas you're saying, hey, we just do it all. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of the one in a row doofus that not smart enough to tell people no. Yeah, it, it's just, we're, we're tooled very, very heavy just, just to be the one in a row guy. And I, I use each piece of equipment for the simplest thing it does the best, uh, which, which is kind of funny. A, a, a lot of people think I'm kind of hand tools only from the classes, but my, my day, day to day work, I, I swing a hammer very little. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the classes. So you run classes in your shop. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. What does a class look like when somebody says, I want to learn from you? I guess it's, it's a little bit different. The, the atmosphere is pretty loose. We have a, a talk first thing in the morning about kind of the six things I, I run through my head on every sheet metal I'm ever going to shape. And if I can't build a battle plan that is any less than five steps, it's too complicated. You need to need to sit and stare at it till it confesses. Mm -hmm. So we, we really don't start until the how and why is figured out because the the metal will do lots of things if you just ask it the right way. If right. if you're going to be brutal with it and force it to go, you're you're going to run out of horsepower to move it. Mm, interesting. Are you more of a when you teach hand classes, tools. Are you more of a stretch or a shrink type of process? What do you guys prefer? Well, I'm I'm kind of a weirdo that I'm a shrink first kind of guy. Um, a lot of traditional methods are are stretch first. And I, I can't confirm it. It's it's my opinion that tra traditional methods were stretch first because it was cheaper to equip each man with the tools that he needed. Because you, you have 30 guys in a shop making parts, uh, give them a sandbag, a stump, and four hammers, and you, you have them on piecework so they're not lollygagging. They get good <laughs> at that part really quick with what they've got. You go up there, you cut down that tree, you get that stump, you come back in, that's your tool for the day. <laughs> I, I've always been a shrink first kind of guy because it, it gives you directional control. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, say a 37 Ford rear fender, that top has to go over quite a bit. There's not a lot of crown front to rear. So if you started stretching first, it, it always looked hard to me to tame the bubble and not, not have the fender over crowned front to rear. But if right. you shrank it first, and you got the edge radius correct, any amount of stretch that you needed was just, just to kind of blow it out so the edges would fit. Right. And I guess, too, you can clean up your shrink marks as you stretch it back into position. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you stop a little, little bit short to when you, have, when you have to stretch it just to get the edges to sit. You, you've got enough room to make a lot of the marks go away. And uh, to, to me, it's, it's always been easier to get a settled panel that way. And uh, the class guys, we, we usually do one one way and one the other way. And I let them decide how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When students come to see you, are there any bad habits you have to extract and be like, okay, this is not the way that we do this. I know this is what you've seen, or I know this is how you've done it in the past, but we have to let go of those things and we have to start from scratch. Do, do people come with any of these preconceived notions of how to do something and you, you bust that myth? There, there's a few things. I, I, I don't like that because I... I I don't like the being the put in the position of a guy who puts his hands on his hips and says, prove me wrong. I don't like that position, <laughs> but uh, it, it usually happens in the welding end of it because mm. no, no other topic than welding before you know it, you're a no good so-and-so and your uncle Bob is too. Maybe the only other topic that way would be uh, contact flats versus full radius in the wheel. That, that one's pretty heated also. I, I've always approached that from, let, let's do one one way and one the other way, and you, you can decide for yourself. This is what I prefer, but I'm, I'm not going to beat you over the head with what I prefer. Sure. That's a good way to do it because, I mean, I would assume that everybody has their own preferred methods and there's lots of ways to get to town, right? Well, yeah, and, and if a guy is good at doing it in a way that I don't like, I don't need to change him. He's getting good results with it. 
the, the sheet metal doesn't care as long as the, the cumulative action gets you where you need to go. Let's switch gears here and talk about tools. So you're very known for your English wheels. And I would say just based on uh, some of the posts that you've put out and some of the content and things like that, that's your gig, right? The English wheel, is that fair to say? Uh, yeah. That And the, the funny thing is uh, Imperial Wheeling Machines was started by Kerry Pinkerton in Huntsville, Alabama uh, in the early 2000s. And um, I bought a, an Imperial wheel from Kerry because the angled tool arm and it just looked more versatile. And uh, it was the first commercially made piece of equipment I could afford. And uh, cool. I got to be f friends with him. He, he's a rather intense person. Kind of ask a question. He'd stare at you till you answer him. And I don't know, I'd say something uh, halfway smart and then something ridiculous. And I, I don't know, he either took a liking to me or tolerated me. I don't know which yet to this day. But uh, I, I bought Imperial Wheeling Machines from, from Kerry about six years ago and spent two years just trying to tool it and standardize it so I, I could make them all exactly the same. Kerry built very, very good machines. The best way to just it was each machine was an individual they were kind of gunsmithed together yeah. because they, they they were fantastic machines but if he had a little bit better idea on thursday that's what that machine got sure the evolving the evolving tool it's never done that that's why i took two years to kind of go where i wanted to go and uh I, I hit my marks and I'm, I'm very happy with it. And I, I can confidently say it is the most versatile machine on the market. And that's not a marketing ploy. It's just, uh, we, we have a lot of different cradles. It's easy to set up with our, our quick change cradle system and uh, the adjustable legs. That's, it's a very simple thing. Um, yeah. If you're working on a fender, it's infinitely faster to wheel it than it is to hammer and dolly it. But if it hits the floor, you're, you're kind of hosed. Well, ra <laughs> raise the machine yeah. so it doesn't hit the floor. I mean, pretty simple. Right. Or if right. You're, you're, you're working on sports car panels with, you're, you're working on sports car panels that have lots of reverses and you're always pulling up on them. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it doesn't work if it's chest high, you know, slam the machine to the floor. So it's belly button high. Yeah. When you're doing these, are you shipping, are you shipping nationwide? That, are people that, picking them up? How does that typically work? We, we have shipped them to Hawaii, Canada, um, parts and pieces to New Zealand, uh, some stuff to England all, all over the place. And I, I tell people if they come pick them up, they, they can spend two days in the shop and really get to know their machine in, in the shop with a little guidance. And I, I encourage that, but we, we ship a lot of them. That's a, that's really cool. I mean, it's one thing to have a nice tool. It's another thing to know how to use it. They're very different disciplines, right? One can be purchased with dollars and the other one takes time. Yes. And that, that's the thing that, uh, the, the preload mechanism that we have in the machine is, is not a wildly technical thing, but if you understand how to adjust it, you, you can just get a little more out of the machine is it, it's kind of ridiculous that nothing has been made for a wheel in the last hundred years that makes it easier to use. And was that of your design or was that Kerry? That, that was my design. Um, that, that's some dirt track trickery right there <laughs> coming out of the racing world. The, the simple thing about it is uh, why everyone likes the feel of a cast English wheel is when that, that machine was poured, it, it cooled and it shrank. The frame is loaded all the time. Right. Well, a fabricated machine, the only way you can make load in it is to weld on it. And welding structural things of, of higher alloy, it's kind of a nightmare because things move and it, it's, it's a deal. But the welding process, I, I got the frame to where I liked it. And now the preload lets you put the frame under tension like a cast machine. So mm -hmm. I, I've kind of hit somewhere halfway between a, a very good fabricated machine and a cast machine. I've kind of hit right in the middle something that I wanted. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very happy with it. And it, it just brings a little more versatility when, when you can make right. an adjustment right. there. Yeah. Was Carrie the guy 
Did he invent something called the hot dog die? I remember seeing something on YouTube about a hot dog die, something in the industry floating around. I feel like it was him. It was like maybe an Art Deco style fender that he was working on. Is that him? Yes. Uh, I, I believe uh, Terry Stolarski invented the hot dog die and, and Carrie was demonstrating it. That That's a wild thing. Just a, a rubber box, dock bumper and a, and a curved piece of bar stock and poof, there it goes. I love the creativity when guys come up with stuff on the simplest, the absolute simplest of technology, like not even technology. As you say, a rumper, rubber bumper and a you know piece of round bar. But that's nothing flashy. That's nothing, you know, nothing over the top. There's no technology there, but it's so effective. Very, very simple, but very effective. And I, I think that that's a big part of sheet metal shaping if you can understand the action it it doesn't matter what you use to get there as long as long as you can repeat the action the, the metal does not care pat this has been so much fun to have you on the show today talk about what you're building the classes you're running uh some of the things that you've done in the past i mean it's 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 special to have 30 minutes or however long we spent here yeah about 30 minutes uh, it's special to have this time together and I can tell that you're so genuine and sincere yeah. and, uh, do, do truly believe in what you're doing. So for me to you from, from this side of the border over, uh, to Nebraska, uh, I really appreciate your time today. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, on our website, uh, wheelingmachines.com on Facebook, just look us up on Imperial wheeling machines. Uh, same thing on Instagram. And, uh, if any of you guys are traveling through Nebraska, the, the shop is always open. I, I've always got a couple minutes. I am free to drop in on. So just, just give me a call at the shop and always up to some shenanigans anyway. Very good. Pat Brubaker, don't forget to like, share, follow, and subscribe. And we will see you on the next episode.